My name is Uday Kapoor. I'm a volunteer at the museum, and uh, I am involved with the uh, computer, the histories uh, program. We capture the histories of all the luminaries in the industry. So welcome, Mark um, Hemmelstein. Uh, I got introduced uh, to you by Rob Maines, who I work with very closely at Sun, and I was at Sun for almost 20 years. I also was the guy that did the first spark chip, uh, the Cypress uh, Sun chip. So have a little bit of history from Sun. So welcome. Thank and you. Uh, so what we like to do is and work with me as my colleague, um, Doug Fairburn. We have done many interviews together. So we like to uh, start with your early history, where you were born, your early life. So if you could maybe start with that. Sure. Um, I was born in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, Northeast Pennsylvania, um, probably most known now for being 20 miles away from Scranton where the office is filmed. Uh, but it was a very sort of depressed area because uh, it was a coal mining uh, town and they mined too close to the river and, and that got shut down in the 30s. I was born in 1960 and by that time it was a pretty depressed area. Uh, so. Uh, I grew up in this this kind of this quaint little town that now sort of the biggest industry are colleges. They have universities and colleges locally, um, but not much else. There's Can you not talk much about your family a little bit? Your dad, your uh, siblings? Uh, sure. I um, so uh, you know I, it's not the first thing I share in general, but I'm glad to share it. I'm I'm not uh, in any way embarrassed by this, but it's. Uh, uh, it was a tough upbringing. Uh, my, my father uh, was schizoaffective, so he, had, he was mentally ill. My parents got divorced when I was seven, um, and my mom was a, a teacher in a Hebrew day school, and um, not much money coming in, and you know, we lived fairly simply, uh, but we were happy. You know, We played games and laughed and had fun, um, and um, you know, that really dominated a lot of my youth. Um, my mother uh, got remarried, and then we had a flood. Uh, Agnes, Hurricane Agnes, you might remember, uh, there was 18 feet of water in my house. Um, and uh, this is when I was 12 years old. Um, but, you know, I didn't really get along with my stepfather. I went away, actually, to a, to, to a yeshiva, a Jewish school, uh, in, in my teen years. Um, and my mom eventually got divorced again, and I came home for uh, undergraduate. And so I went to Wilkes, then college, now university. Um, and I have one brother who's older. Um, uh, my parents are past at this point. Uh, my brother lives uh, close by in, in San Carlos. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, I, I got an undergraduate degree in math and computer science. I, went into the, uh, the, uh, the dean of admissions office and I was thinking about psychology or accounting and he said, well, we have this new program in computer science. Why don't you try it out? We're a liberal arts school. You have to take that other stuff anyway. After a year, you can decide. And, um, you know, my first Fortran class, I was hooked, you know, and kind of never stopped from there. Um, ended up getting the ability to work uh, at the Institute for Defense Analysis in Princeton, New Jersey. Um, Before you yeah. leap ahead there. Sure. Uh, so what year did you enter university or college at the time? Um, I, I had skipped a year in kindergarten. So I was, uh, it was 1977. Uh, and I finished in about three and a half years. So I ended up going to graduate school in 1980. So before you entered uh, college, you were not especially inclined to math or science or whatever well, before Well, my was. SATs were pretty skewed. It's really kind of funny. <laughs> my, my math scores were really good. My English scores were mm, mediocre. Uh, and so uh, that's why the dean said, hey, why don't you try this new program? And they had uh, the guy who solved the four color problem, uh, John Koch, helped solve that. He was one of the professors they had hired. And another guy was from, um, uh, I think he's like undergrad MIT and graduate school from you know, somewhere in Southern California. And they had gotten these two young professors to come work there. And boy, I was really lucky. I mean, it was a very 
intense computer science program at a time where that stuff wasn't happening. And, and they bought good computers. I mean, we had a Hazeltine 1200s. We, I actually got to type on screens instead of doing cards. Punch cards, yeah. Yeah, and we had to do punch cards for some IBM hmm. class, but you know, besides that, it was all typing. So you got hooked on Fortran and that's, and you got a degree in computer science? They actually I, have I a actually computer ended up with, science degree? Uh, well, I ended up with two degrees. I <laughs> it's kind of funny, I, the math department was on the same floor as computer science department. I didn't want to leave, so I just signed up for as many math classes as I could. And uh, the, the semester before I was supposed to graduate, the head of the math department came to me and said, hey, you're one class away from <laughs> a degree in math, please go sign up today. So I did, and so I have a degree in both math and yeah, computer so science. Yeah, so you did a BS in math and computer science. Yeah. Okay, that was in 1980. Yeah, and you know, again, I, I ended up being lucky because uh, Dr. Koch, uh, who was the four color guy, used to work in summers at the Institute for Defense Analysis, and he dragged me down there. And I got to work on a Cray One, Cray One number six, in you know 1979. So that was quite amazing, and so I was very grateful. Uh, have you seen the Cray One we have downstairs? Uh, no, it's probably uh, bring bring back some some interesting good memories. Uh, yeah, these guys had CDCs 6600s and uh, you know all that stuff, yeah. you know. Um, but it, it was fun. I mean, you know, I wrote a diagnostic program that survived me and went off to. I think Los Alamos and Livermore and stuff like that. And, yeah, it was so you had quite a, a traumatic uh, childhood. Uh, I Absolutely. Absolutely. And in spite of that, uh, you know, you did well. Uh, I blame my mother. Uh, my mother was just great. Uh, she was very supportive. Uh, in, in the worst of times, she would uh, encourage us to laugh and um, you know, she said, if you can't laugh during hard times, then life's not worth living. So, so I'm very grateful. She, she was just, I mean, I couldn't have asked for a better mom. We can talk about mental illness later. I, <laughs> <laughs> my son has schizoaffective disorder as yeah, well. Yeah, I'm sorry. So, yeah, I mean, there's more people in my family with it too. So uh, it, it's, it's an insidious, very hard disease. Um, and as you see later in my story, uh, there are some people who have had some physical illnesses too, and I would take a physical illness any day of the week over a mental illness. So then after uh, your BS in, uh, uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, looks like you moved westward to UC Davis. How did that happen? Yeah, so um, the people at, at Princeton encouraged me to go to graduate school, and I got the ACM book, you know, with all the the different schools and the people with the best machines and the best stipend was this branch of UC Davis at Lawrence of Moore Labs. And so I applied there. And because I was finishing school, I finished school in December of uh, you know, 1980, um, because of that, I really um, uh, didn't get accepted into this program because they wanted to fill all the slots. And so they put me on a wait list. And the only other place I applied to was uh, SUNY at Stony Brook, and I got in there as well. And so I was kind of waiting that fall to decide where I was going to go. And then somebody had dropped out, and they said, if you want it, it's yours. And so out I came. So you were actually attending a school at Lawrence Livermore Labs as opposed to? Correct. They had a branch. They called it Teller Tech. So this Ed Teller set it up for the sort of the frustrated professors. Uh, in the lab who wanted to teach. Um, and they only had two degrees. One was applied math, basically physics, and the other was um, computing science, as they called it. Um, and so I was in the computing science program. Um, it's like a very small building on the sort of the east side of the lab. And um, we got to go ahead and, and um, uh, you know, have great professors, uh, you know, like uh, the guy who, who uh, you, you know, wrote a bunch of the, um, the OSI stack for Springer Verlag and the very famous Oktoberfest book from 1977 or something was one of our professors, Dick Watson. Uh, so we had some like just incredible luminaries who were teaching us and, and <laughs> it, was, it was quite something. And then because I had had already a security clearance for working at 
uh, Institute for Defense Analysis, I got my clearance fairly quickly to work in the labs, and I worked on a, a, a wide array of things there as well, and that was fun. So, so in your first two jobs, you had access to the world's most powerful computers. <laughs> Absolutely, it, it, and you know, uh, you know, I talk to guys now working on RISC V about vector, and they go, "What was it like, you know, <laughs> working on a machine that had vector?" And you know, uh, you know, they had. You know, there's things about staging data, and you know now all that stuff is hidden behind caches and streaming and stuff like that. And you know, back then, there, you know, Seymour had S registers, and you had to fill those darn things in order to fill the the vector registers, right? So um, it, it was quite astonishing. I mean, they had, uh, you know, Seymour had variable length instructions. He had 16-bit instructions called parcels, um, and you know, we have variable length instructions now at RISC-V, 16-bit, 32 maybe 48, for sure 64. So, uh, so it's, it, yeah, I, uh, you know, I was just very lucky. I was very grateful. So you went to uh, San Sandia Labs? For a short time, I went to Sandia Labs because um, I, I didn't really like the jobs at Lawrence Livermore, and so I got a job at Sandia and continued on to my PhD. I had passed my quals, and I started in on the PhD, and. Uh, did that for a year, tried to bring time sharing to their Cray-1, which has already had been at Lawrence Livermore Labs, but the Sandia Labs Cray-1 was, was still running, you know, batch. And so I spent a lot of time down at Los Alamos and, and in Albuquerque, uh, and I got frustrated because it wasn't doing, you know, I wasn't doing a whole lot of technical work. And so, um, so I lasted about a year. I also got bored with, with classes at that point. I could read the books as well as my professors could, and so I just uh, went down to Silicon Valley and Yeah, uh, so interesting that you went to Megatest. I did, you know, <laughs> uh, y you know, um, uh, Richard Swan from CM Star was running their engineering, and so that's what attracted me. I mean, I've always been attracted by rational, incredibly brilliant people, and Richard was incredible to work with. Um, and they had a tester per PIM, which was unheard of in those days. Um, and they had nobody who understood compilers, and I did. And so I came in, and because a lot of their stuff had to do with, you know, compiling down some high-level language down to something the tester could understand and stuff like that, uh, as well as they needed. I mean, we were running Unix in those days, and uh, they needed support with C compilers and assemblers and, and all that. And so and the CEO, the founder was Steve Bissett. Bitt Bissett, yeah, Steve Bissett. Did an oral history with him many years ago. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That company had quite a reputation for its uh, lifestyle. It must have been quite a, uh, a shock or moving from defense-related work to uh, mega tests. It seems like the environments yeah. might be quite different. Uh, or less, maybe not. Less <laughs> different than you might think. <laughs> <laughs> and, I would say enough said on that. <laughs> All right, well, learn something along the way. Yes. <laughs> so what were the, uh, was there any particular accomplishment, uh, breakthrough, important happenings uh, at Megatest that you'd like to? Well, I mean, I mean for, for Megatest, you know, the, the, the important thing really was this tester per pen technology, and they had a real um, you know, um, symmetric multiprocessor, you know, operating system and piece of hardware running on 68Ks, mul you know, multiple 68Ks. And, and that was pretty unique in those days. The only people, other people who were doing that were people like Sun, right? And so it was, uh, it was quite amazing. And, um, you know, I, I, again, I helped out, you know, heavily in, in the compilers, but I also helped out in the operating systems and got involved in operating systems at that point. Um, so, you know, uh, I did a, uh, a remote file system when everybody else was doing, you know, NFS and this and that. I did one, you know, at, at sort of user level and, uh, uh, you know, made that available you know, before the days really of open source. Uh, but uh, so, you know, I got to do, again, a bunch of just fun stuff and just help the company uh, get product out there and you know I think part of it was understanding you know regimentation and I think some of my early upbringing of like you know we didn't have weekends off when I was in high school right it just it was just part of the whole thing I really wasn't like everybody else uh, you know they 
they looked at weekends as sacrosanct. Well, that was really good training for Silicon Valley, right? Because yeah, that was the work ethic at that time. It, exactly. There was, you know, in those days, you know, y you were there um, 16, 18 hours a day. You ate dinner and other meals with your colleagues and I mean, even when I was sick, I was on kind of full time. You know. Well, those of us that d were designing chips, and we had large teams, and so that was the work ethic. You know, yep. there was no weekend. You know. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I remember buying the Megatest and various companies, and uh, listening to the sales folks and all that. So I think you were the provider of all that background for. <laughs> You know, tester per pin and all that. Yeah. yeah. And and also, you know, I think, you know, in those days, the VLSI designers and other folks didn't have a whole kind of concept about things like uh, build systems and stuff like that. And uh, there was a, a systems gentleman, a guy named Ken Matisau, who had a, like, one of the few people I think in the world has a degree in systems. He got it from, from Wisconsin, you know, one of the... The, uh, I can't remember which, which school it was there. And so he, he looked at things more broadly and he helped me understand things more broadly. And we helped the rest of the crew understand things more broadly so you could actually, you know, have, you know, one button installs of, you know, work that was being written by, I don't know, 50 people. And that was, uh, you know, uh, pretty incredible as well. Um, when, you know, you start taking a look at complex systems, um, you know, the integration's tough. I mean, take a look at Boeing when they're building a, a, an airplane. You know, it's hard to make it all fit together. And the same thing was true for the Mega One. So then uh, you moved on to MIPS, I guess. Yeah, a couple of my colleagues went there. And so um, went on to MIPS. And again, just an incredible crew of people. Uh, I ended up working for a gentleman named Larry Weber and, and, and John Mashey, who, you know, you guys know. Um, and, and, you know, again, got to do incredible things. You know, we were uh, another gentleman, uh, Earl Killian, who was, uh, you know, an architect there. Uh, I've now dragged into RISC-5, so he's now the vice chair of our unprivileged committee. Uh, mine like a steel trap, and he uh, enabled us to go ahead and run MIPS instructions on a VAX at about 600K per second, which was astonishing in those days. And I created the debugger that allowed you to single step either the MIPS or the VAX instructions and be able to see, right? Um, you know, I worked with uh, Fred Chow, who very famous in the um, optimization uh, stuff, worked for, you know, John, well, was a student of John Hennessy's at Stanford and then was part of MIPS. And we did cross-module optimization, one of the first implementations where, you know, you can compile things separately and bring them together and then do the optimization so you can do, you know, cross-module um, register allocation and code hoisting and all that kind of stuff. So um, just able to do an amazing amount of things. And then, you know, an another thing was that in those days we had 8K direct map iCaches. And, you know, silly, uh, you know, benchmarks like NROF didn't fit in an 8K iCache. So, I wrote, I wrote code that took profiling data and reorganized the code in order to make it fit in the, in the cache. Uh, I, I think the point of my saying these things is, is, is just there was an unending list of opportunities to excel and do something interesting. And if, if we actually did software patents in those days, I'd probably have 30 patents from, from that period of time. As it is, I have one patent from that period of time or, and a, a few follow-ons. Uh, because I created the fastest algorithm for byte swapping using low word lefts and low word rights, and, and so I have by Indian patents. Um, but it was a great group of people, and those people, in the end, brought me into RISC V three years ago. They just said, hey, would you be willing to do this? And so they're at a company called Ariel now, uh, the Ariel, which is the piece of the pomegranate, the little seed. Uh, and, um, and you know, those are relationships I built in the 80s, so. So, uh, would you say that uh, with your background in math and computer science, uh, are you a computer architect or a micro-architect or a software developer? How would you classify your expertise? Um, so, so, I think that my biggest expertise is synthesis. 
I can take 100 facts together and then put a plan together that's got a 95% probability of, of working. And so I, I can gather stuff from a lot of people. And, and you know, you develop that more as a consultant over the years, and probably a third to a half of my career is consulting. And so I hone that. I, I think, you know, I have expertise from the application layer all the way down to the ISA. I, I am not a VLSI designer, I'm not a microarchitect, but you know, I have passions about pieces of those things, and we can talk about those in a little bit. But, um, but you know, my last job before RISC V was I was helping uh, FICO with anti-money laundering software, right? And they, they had a, you know, bigger customers than they've ever had before. They had to be able to do something that was fail over and, you know, fail back and, and just reliable, and they didn't know how to do it because they were really applications developers and scoring developers, right? Data scientists. So, uh, so I, I think uh, I have an eclectic set of skills, and uh, I find a lot of things interesting. I don't feel like I have to work on, you know, something in particular. And I usually find something very interesting no matter what I'm, I'm working on. So getting back to the mega chips to MIPS transition, was there anything that drove you away from mega chips, or was it just to new opportunities at MIPS? What was the, what well, was the I, background of the change? You know, I think all companies have ups and downs, and and you know, y you know, we know that that the the radical ups and downs of various pieces of the industry are, you know, they're steeper, they're steeper up, steeper down. And I think we were in a steep down at that point and it was affecting, you know, Megatest. Um, uh, these buddies of mine went over to MIPS and said, why don't you come over and talk to us? And I went over there, I was really excited. So I think- it was What was the size of MIPS at the time? I was employee 45. Okay, so it was pretty early days. Very early, yeah. And you were there for quite a number of years, six years? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So got, got to do an amazing set of things. I eventually ended up running the operating system groups for um, you know, our uh, desk sides, our big servers, uh, et cetera. Uh, did all the position independent code for dynamic shared objects. I mean, so just you know, a, a wide variety of things. Very, very cool, very exciting. So, uh, the next step uh, after MIPS, would you, could you explain yourself? It says Apple, so anything? Uh, well, actually, I, I ended up doing consulting in between, and so that's when I started, you know, my love for consulting. Consulting for me was really wonderful in that I felt like I had impunity. I can go in, they're paying me good money, I can go in and tell them the truth. <laughs> and it's like, if you want to accept it, that's fine. If you don't, that's okay too. You're paying me either way. So, um, so I, I just start, I started initially um, uh, consulting for DEC, um, and I did the floating point completion routines for Alpha because, uh, you know, I don't know if you know Dick Seitz. So, uh, Dick says, you can blame me for this. He didn't want to put the, the D-norms uh, uh, support in, uh, in, into the chip, and so I did D-norms in, in software. They also had some, you know, some of the status bits uh, for floating point um, that weren't adhered to, and I dealt with those in software. I did it on the Ultrix side because there was a whole bunch of people doing it on the VMS side as well. Um, but uh, worked for them for as a consultant probably for, for about two years. Um, and so that was exciting too. I mean, I got to do some great things, um, got to help them a lot. I, I did exception handling uh, over the years as well. When I, I didn't say when I was at MIPS, I did it as part of ADA and we, you know, crushed the benchmarks out of CMU. And so I helped DEC with their exception handling and uh, moving to 64-bit, you know, and, and all those things. Plus they, you know, they, um, you know, you had to put fences in because um, if you wanted to do any kind of exception handling, if you wanted to do any kind of debugging, um, you know, their, their stuff was out of order and, and you had to put fences in to tell where things were at. So, I mean, all that stuff, again, I got to work on really interesting technology uh, and got to help them be successful um, with that. So you were a consultant for four years. 
Roughly. I, I've been a consultant on and off through my career for probably, uh, y you know, I would have to imagine 20 years, uh, but under dis different auspices. So uh, Himmelsoft initially, and then Heavenstone. Heavenstone is the uh, English for Him Himmelstein. So <laughs> Heavenstone Incorporated. And so I've had Heavenstone since 2004. Uh, but yeah, I went, um, after doing consulting for a while, um, I consulted for Apple, and then, uh, and there we did uh, MAE, which is a Mac on a, uh, uh, you know, on a, like HP or Sun or other box, uh, doing it with a simulator emulator, depending on how you look at it. Um, and, you know, got some patents there as well, but um, I ran that group for, you know, some period of time, and then they asked me to come in as a director and not only run that group, but to run their tools group too. So I ran their tools group and the MAE group uh, for some period of time, but that was kind of like the worst period of time in Apple's history. You know, it was like uh, Spindler imploding, uh, you know, the, the follow-on regimes that were, you know, just didn't understand their business. Uh, and that's where I, I met Ike Nassi, uh, who, uh, you know, uh, obviously is, very ensconced in the Computer History Museum, and he's still a friend to this day. Uh, but it was a very difficult time, and so I stayed maybe a year as an employee and probably two years as a consultant there. Um, and had, again, had a lot of, lot of fun, you know, doing, you know, how do you go ahead and t test a 68K from a software perspective? How do you test Mac OS from a, a, a software perspective automatically? And, you know, we, we were just, we were doing it. And, you know, we'd single step with, with P-Trace emulation and compare register sets and, you know, we'd have compression and blah, blah, blah. So we, we did a lot of interesting things. So I wonder how time. the, you know, the security protocol at Apple is, uh, I mean, unequal. I mean, there's, the, so I wonder in those days how they handle a consultant relative to. Um, you know, we, I was, you know, off in, in the, the, uh, the Unix OS land, and that was really not in Mac OS land. And so I think there was a little less rain over that. Uh, but, you know, as long as I did my work, that's what they cared about, right? And that's the great thing about being a consultant. It's like, it's really clear. You agree on what you're going to do, you do it, they pay you, they're happy, you're happy. Right, and it's a great thing. And along the way, I just, I got better and better at helping teams out do things. I was a manager at MIPS. Um, at the end, um, I went back and forth. Every time I'd go back and forth, people would say, oh, it's such a shame that you're not doing individual contributor work and now you're doing management work. It's what a loss, right? And then I'd go from being a manager to being an individual contributor, they oh, you know. It's such a shame you're not being a manager anymore. But I went back and forth a number of times over the years. Um, and then, you know, I think as a consultant, you slowly hone your skills in that, um, in a way that you can't any other way. Because you, you change your language, right? It, it's more about, okay, I suggest, as opposed to I say, right? It's, what do you think? And then you have to sandwich everything in a compliment, right? It's like, wow, you did really great, like, what about this, you know? And then, that, you know, that really was great work. So, so you learn those things, and that helps you to be a manager. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, the times when I've, I think, stayed in as a manager in a company too long, I'd forget those things. Uh, so I eventually wrote a book, and, and that was, you know, partially, um, Right. Getting yeah. back to your MIPS, uh, since you've been there for been there for several years, uh, what caused you to move on, and uh, was there? Yeah, I mean, I th I think w we too had a m number of ups and downs. I mean, there's I mean, there's plenty of people who've written about MIPS, right. and you know, almost you know, picked as the replacement processor for the 68K at Apple, and and that got killed at the last moment because of a leak. I mean, there was just uh, tons of those kind of things. Uh, they, you know, kind of initiated the first real licensee agreements, right? So they licensed the actual um, design 
of MIPS to places like DEC uh, and, and IDC and you know so on and so forth. It was a different model and that was all very exciting. But financially, they never did really well, you know. Um, you know, the, uh, sort of the high point was when they went public. And, and after that, you know, it was just brutal. And Very competitive uh, pressures, like uh, from Sun. Yeah, yeah, competitive, but also I think there is, uh, in hindsight, I think it's always hindsight. You know, mistakes were made and we could have done better. But the people there were brilliant. The technology is brilliant. And, you know, those people have gone on to see, you know, many of the leading places in the world. What would you say is one or two of the most critical decisions which led it down the wrong path versus the right path? I mean, y yes. Well, I, let, history is always good, uh, easier, but it's also a good lesson sometimes. Pardon me. Let, I mean, let's first say, you know, some of the things it did really well, right? This is my, my sandwiching stuff with a compliment here. <laughs> let's start with a positive. It, it changed how the world looked at compilers, mm -hmm. right? The hardware software trade off that, that Hennessy talked about all the time was evident every single day of our lives. And we changed the investment that not only you know we put into compilers, but places like Sun Microsystems and IBM. Compilers, I mean, they got respect because you know, it was a lot cheaper to go ahead and improve your compiler than go create a new chip with a longer pipe or more stages or more, you know, dual issue, whatever kind of stuff. And so I, I believe we, along with people like Sun, along with people like IBM, really changed everybody's viewpoint on that. And, and that was, I mean, there's a couple of jobs that I've had in my life that I think changed the world. And that was one of them, and that was why. Mm -hmm. It really changed that you know, balance between hardware and software. When we were designing new chips like the R4K, unless people could prove that A, there was functionality that was just totally missing, like, you know, I don't know, watch points or some, something for debugging, or you got double digit performance improvement, they weren't gonna do it, right? So it also had an incredible means test. It had this, reasonability about them. And I was in the design meetings for the R4K and it was like, yeah, you know, go run it on the simulator and if you don't like see improvement in the benchmarks we care about, we're not doing this. That was pretty amazing. But it's also why they fix things that were broken. I mean, everybody, you know, believes, okay, Spark, register windows, bad, right? Uh, MIPS, delay slots, bad, right? You know? And we understood that, and we admitted it, and we fixed it with like branch likelies and stuff like that. So, um, so it, it really did change how the world looked at instruction sets. It looked differently, you know, at how you do um, compilers, and and that was pretty amazing. There have been a lot of great ideas in the past with bad businessmen, right? <laughs> It, uh, just because you have an idea and a good product doesn't mean necessarily that you know how to sell it. It doesn't mean you know how to make a market and so on and so forth. In the end, they really, you know, in my mind, uh, didn't play to a market that was going to go ahead and make them a lot of money. Uh, it was simple business. And eventually they sold, you know, off to SGI, who did have a marketplace and, you know, they had their own problems later on. But they sold off to SGI, who was, you know, really towards, you know, graphics and, you know, um, uh, you know, computing at that level. So, um, so I, you know, I, I, I would attribute it to, to just bad business. I, I don't think from a technology perspective, um, at least, you know, in, in my rear view mirror, I, I don't think we failed in any way, shape or form. I think we, we did, we hit it out of the park. Um, uh, but that doesn't necessarily, I mean, look at how many products in the past, you know, didn't do well because no. of business as opposed to technology. And, you know, frankly, you know, MIPS instruction set and compilers have affected the world since then. I mean, if you take a look at, at you know, the RISC-V instruction set, I believe it's the most elegant instruction set since early MIPS. And I mean, they added a bunch of stuff later on to MIPS, which I think, you know, made it a little bit 
less pretty, um, but um, but uh, you know, I mean, it's still incredibly useful, and, and you know, lots of companies made huge amounts of product, Cavium, et cetera, that, that made a lot of product on MIPS. And it still has an impact today. I mean, there's still, you know, a lot of people using the MIPS instruction set. But MIPS themselves has gone, have gone over to RISC-V. Um, and and it, it just feels familiar to me now, it feels at home. So, so things changed, you, you moved on to DEC. Was there any particular uh, thing you wanted to highlight about the work at DEC? Or? Well, I, I think I talked about it already, you know, doing the floating point completion routines, doing the exception handling. Uh, so I, you know, I just helped them out. Um, there's a gentleman named Ayub Khan who ran the, the compiler group for Ultrix, and once he and I got to know each other, you know, he just wanted me to go do more and more stuff for him. So, so that was as a consultant, right? As a consultant, okay. yeah. So yeah. that ran its course, and you moved on to Apple. Uh, well, I um, I probably did a couple things in between, but yes, I ended up at <laughs> Apple. Um, and again, that was a, a consultant who worked for me at MIPS, brought me into Apple to help him. How would you? So, which group in Deck were you working for or with? It was the Ultrix folks working on Alpha. So they're based in Texas, or where was? No, Mac they're East? in Nashua. Nashua. Okay, they were. So were you working remotely, or were you? I was, and and I actually kept my machine in uh, DeckWorld <laughs> in Palo Alto, and just you know logged in through a modem, and did all my work that way. Early remote worker. I've been a remote worker for so long as part of my career and very happy about it. My dogs are happy about it. I'm happy about it. It's, it's really so your great. residence was always here? My residence was always here. You know, I came into California, into Livermore, and then two years later ended up in Silicon Valley. I've been in one place or another in Silicon Valley since. Did you, uh, between MIPS, DEC, Apple, uh, Deck, it sounds like you perhaps were not really sort of immersed in the organization, but you know, between MIPS and Apple, were you, uh, was the style of the organization or the company shockingly different, or were you, it sort of didn't matter at the level you were operating at, or? Well, I, I, again, I think that um, I, I'm, I'm, I consider myself a very honest person, and um, you know, when somebody comes in and says, hey, can you do that? in three months and you say no and they don't like it, like what happens? Well, if you're a consultant, it doesn't matter, right? You go in and say the truth and it, it goes on. But in companies like, you know, that are big, it doesn't make a difference how big, they're trying to meet some goal. And um, sometimes they don't really uh, honor the truth. Um, and I think that there are different styles too. I mean, you know, Apple, um, I, I think there are a lot of people who had agendas there, and um, and that's okay. I mean, but it wasn't for me. I, it just really wasn't for me. the The best corporate environment that I ever lived in was uh, the early days when I was at Sun, because I, I always used to say, uh, at Sun, you didn't have to worry about s somebody stabbing you in, in the back because they're going to come right at your chest. And that I can handle. It's honest, at least, right? You know, the, you know they're coming. You can have an honest, you know, discussion. And the leadership at that point, Ed Zander, uh, liked those discussions. He let them happen. I was in many meetings where he let them happen. And and you know, you can come out with a really good solution if you're just honest, right? And you're straightforward about things, and you're realistic. And so, I, from a corporate environment, I probably got along better at Sun. Uh, and, and, and for a lot of people, it didn't work because they couldn't handle people coming at them f full frontal, right? But for me, it was, it was just fine because I didn't take anything personally. You probably I, I, enjoyed it. <laughs> well, I don't know if I enjoyed it, but, but I will tell you, I mean, I have an attitude, I, I don't take things personally. If you come to me and say, hey, Mark, I need you to do something different because you did this and you pissed this person off or whatever, and I go, 
that's okay. All right, give me the details. Let's talk about how it can be better. I don't, and, and I think I learned that early on through the, some of the mental health stuff and family therapy and all that kind of stuff. So I learned not to take things personally. Um, and, and for the most part, I can avoid being defensive. Uh, you know, there's once in a while I'm human, uh, just like anybody else. But um, that makes it so much easier. At Apple, it was still, there was a lot of people telling other people what they wanted to hear as opposed to what they should have hear, heard. Um, and I think that changed later on when the, when the whole Steve Jobs crew came in. I mean, it was a different uh, uh, dynamic that I'm not familiar with, but it certainly wasn't the dynamic that... Well, you didn't overlap with Steve Jobs. No, no. I, I left, bef bef like, right at the beginning of Gil Emilio. Yeah. So let's move on to Sun. Yeah, so I, I ended up, um, you know, doing a little consulting in be between... Uh, for um, a place called Magic Circle Media that was tracking objects frame for frame in a, in a uh, video and stuff like that. And then um, my buddy Larry from MIPS came after me again. Larry Weber was my manager at MIPS. He came after me at Sun. He was running the, the tools group. And so I became the director of architecture for tools. Um, and, you know, I did my thing. I came in and was honest. <laughs> and as being a director of architecture, it's easier to be honest, I think, than if you're you're a product, you know, oriented manager. Um, and you know, we, you know, accomplished some things. And uh, very quickly, they were looking for somebody to go run Solaris. And uh, I worked for for Rich Green, and he hired me to run Solaris. And um, that was, I would say, another one of the earth-breaking, you know, um, uh, groundbreaking uh, uh, jobs in my career. I mean, we did things like ZFS, D-Trace, Zones, which are, you know, I think looked on universally as, as just an incredible set of things. And when I came in, uh, my boss's boss, you know, I, I met with him and I said, okay, what do you want me to do? And, and you know, what's success in a year? And he said two things. One is, I want them to innovate because they had just gone from SunOS to Solaris and it took them 10 years to really swallow that. And they had really turned all the innovators into bug fixers. Um, and then the second thing was that they wanted uh, some respect because um, the, the team wasn't very nice. <laughs> and I remember one of my first meetings with the Kernel guys and they said, well, what do you want from us? And it's like, same passion, more respect. That's what I want. And so I enabled them to go do a bunch of stuff. And I remember one guy uh, came in uh, and, you know, I wanted him to work on um, reliability because, uh, you know, there was, there was a lack of an infrastructure around reliability inside of Solaris. Uh, and, uh, and I said, I need you to be the architect for this. And he goes, well, if I'm the architect, how am I going to fix all the bugs that those hardware guys, so software guys in the hardware group are putting in? And I go, well, if you want to do that, that's all you're ever going to do. And he just saw a light go on in his eyes. And so we just innovated. Um, you know, we were at that time competing against, you know, uh, Windows 2000 and we had to tell a story and we had to have uh, compelling stuff and it was in the middle still in the middle of the dot-com uh, you know era um, and uh, you know we were coordinating the work of 2,500 people around Sun 500 of which reported to me um, and you know it's everything from Java to the you know the, the work to support domains and in, in the E10Ks and so on and so forth and um, it, it was it was fun. I mean, we. So, was there any discussion of uh, Solaris on x86? So I own that too. I, I own Solaris on x86. I also own Secure Solaris, which was you know used by the FBI and folks like that. But that um, didn't happen, right? No, x86 Solaris happened, and we supported it. We had bought a company before I showed up there in LA that did a bunch of that stuff, and in fact, we signed up for doing Itanium right with Intel and we had you know red books and you know all that kind of stuff and uh, and people used to ask me it's like hey titanium seems like amazing is there anything going to beat it and I go yeah there's one chip that's really going to kill it what, what chip is that it's called x86 and that was the truth um, but you know 
just like every other company hit 9-11, ups and downs, what are you going to do with your budget? And I basically said, look, if you really want to save Solaris for Spark, you got to kill Solaris on x86. So they killed Solaris at my behest uh, on x86, and I told all my guys, put it somewhere safe because it's coming out again. Don't yeah. worry. Sure enough, and like then Linux uh, happened. Well, but not only that, but nine months later or something, we we resurrected um, Solaris on x86. Uh, I'm the person who forced the Solaris guys to put all the Linux libraries and tools into to Solaris, and the guy who was running that stuff. Uh, came to me and said, I don't want to do this. And I said, it's fine. If you don't want to do it, I will find somebody who does. And he went back and did it. And so we were one of the first ones that was a proprietary operating system. We had a slash, you know, user slash Linux, and it had the whole Linux tree underneath it. Um, so we just did a huge amount of stuff. Um, and, you know, we were um, leaders in things like you know, protocols, so IPv6. We were leaders in security. I mean, we just did tons of stuff. You know, there was Secure Solaris, and, and, and it was very popular, and it knew how to do isolation that, you know, many OSs still don't know how to do today. Um, and so um, it was a grand time. I mean, we just accomplished a lot of stuff. Uh, I just I did it for a long time. I did it for four years, and it was like evidently I was the one who lasted the longest doing that job. And then I decided I wanted to go do something else, and I went and did something else, and then all the regimes changed. So, uh, you know, Jonathan Schwartz took over and stuff like that, and he and I never saw eye to eye, even before. Um, uh, I so was you overlapped stuff. with him? Yeah, I did. Um, I, I uh, yes. I was involved in evaluating Lighthouse, which is w how he came into uh, Sun. So he and I uh, never saw eye to eye, and uh, it was clear that when he took over, he wanted people um, who were going to say yes to him. And um, that's what he got. And I left. So, uh, you know, a lot of people later blamed Sun for uh, not supporting x86, you know, Solaris on x86 properly or whatever. A lot of the users were yeah. very unhappy. Um, and they said that the Linux, rise of Linux on, with Intel and all that <coughs> happened because Sun didn't follow through very well. Uh, so I don't know what your comment was. Yeah, I, I don't really agree with that. I you know, I talked to the CEO of Red Hat in 99, and, you know, it, it was clear that there was something going on with Linux that was beyond technology. It still is not the best operating system out there. But people feel like it's their house, right? It, it's going to get better over time. If they really need to fix something, they can. And they're not beholden and locked into a, a vendor who's going to charge them a huge amount of money, right? And, and that mentality of it's our house, it belongs to us, is one of the fundamental reasons why RISC-V is successful as well. They feel the same way about RISC-V. Linux grew up in a community, and it built this following because people could play. They could do what they wanted to do. And it also made money. Like it actually ran applications and did all these things and it constantly got better. I mean, I, I bought a Tesla in 2019. What do I love about the Tesla the most? I wake up and there's a new software release and there's new stuff in there. Uh, same thing's true with Linux. I mean, new stuff comes out every year. It gets better and better and better. Um, People have variations to address issues that the main Linux group doesn't want to address. That's okay. They don't mind. It's open source. They can do that. So, um, so I think that, that um, Linux was going to happen no matter what. You know, at that point, Gerstner had already started painting penguins on corners in San Francisco. Uh, it, it was, a, I, I think, a sociological movement as much as a technological movement. And it still is. <clears throat> you know, this uh, thing of support for x86 on Solaris, um, 
<coughs> that debate <coughs> went on after Oracle uh, took over Sun. Yeah. And I was actually in some of those discussions because I was hearing from our users that please support. Uh, yeah. You know. And That's uh, why it came back yeah. after I killed it. Uh, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, uh, look, th there's good technology out there. There's some things that Solaris did better than anybody else. They had basically um, parallelization all the way down into the drivers, right? If something stopped working well in Oracle, it was because somebody screwed up a driver inside of Solaris. And we hopped on those things really well. The same thing was true on, on x86. The same you know, technology was there. They had you know, locks and so on and so forth, so you, you know, really weren't stuck with this almost sequentialness of execution that occurred you know, before Solaris started doing its thing. And boy, that's just amazing. Um, and, and so uh, the impact was better performance by far. I mean, again, and we also did, you know, some amazing things. So we redid the file system, right? So, you know, Veritas owned the file system business. And, you know, the, the day that we uh, announced that we were fixing, you know, some of the, the, the weirdnesses in the file system inside of Solaris, uh, Veritas' stock went down by a third. Because people understood that it was just you know, Sun's not paying attention to it for a while that, you know, made that happen. And then on top of that, we went to ZFS, and ZFS is still a thing, right? Open ZFS and so on and so forth. And boy, I mean, that sort of changed the, the whole game around those things. Well, Sun did that in place after place after place, whether it was, you know, fiber channel or, um, you know, uh, uh, resource management or, uh, performance analysis, D-Trace has, has become like sort of the standard for how you do performance analysis. And everybody's got a version of it. And, you know, Linux has got its version with S-Trace and a couple of other things. Uh, Apple's got its own, you know, D-Trace. So it, it's really, we, we changed the world yeah, in so many ways. Yeah, a lot of the ways. concepts that came from some. When, from when I came in there, they had no um, plans in different areas, so I created like six different programs. One, some in discrete things, some in more attributes. So networking, reliability, you know, data, blah blah blah. And I forced them to go ahead and actually have, you know, give me a picture of. I said, don't give me these thirty-page presentations. Give me a picture of what you see today, and what I will see in three to five years if you actually accomplish what you want to accomplish. Um, that also enabled us to go raise money internally in order to get the work done. So since we're talking about Sun, um, did you have any, do you have any views on the Java uh, developers and also the impact, you know, the relationship with uh, Google, for example? Well, I, you know, I owned my own Java group when I first took over Solaris because uh, the, the main Java folks were all working on x86. Um, eventually, we handed our, our Solaris and Spark Java people over to the, the, the main Java group. Um, but look, I mean, the concept of, of having some kind of uh, architecture independent ability to execute has lived for a long time. I mean, Forest Basket, right? P code, right? You know. There's tons of, of cases, and it was very clear they were heading to a world that, that does that. And so, you know, maybe today more of it's done with scripting languages, you know, either JavaScript or Python or Ruby on Rails or whatever it is. But those things don't need to be recompiled, right? And that's really important. And we've lost some of it over time. So if you take a look at, at most of the stuff on Android, it's actually compiled natively for ARM. It's like, when did that happen? So it's almost like we've fallen back a little bit. But, you know, for a whole bunch of these applications, you can get as good performance in something that's doing, you know, a JIT, you know, compiler and, and stuff like that as you can for native stuff. I mean, obviously, if you're doing something fancy with rendering or, you know, data processing or, or inference engines, then, yeah, you want to be native. 
But if you're doing something that's a user application, why would you ever go native, right? I mean, I've, I've got to believe it, it just increases the maintenance and development costs. And I think Google feels similarly. I mean, you know, they've been a very strong supporter of, of uh, Java and other languages. So, um, so, so beyond Sun, then, can you talk about what happened? Yeah, so I left Sun and I, I went to a Paul Allen company for a little bit. And, uh, 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 you know, I think the same, uh, you know, thing happened with me because I ended up in a company that really didn't want to hear the truth. And, and so, you know, I didn't last there uh, too long. Uh, yeah. And then I went off to, uh, to Infoblox. Um, and you know, got them to the point where they had a product that was viable. Got them to actually, um, you know, file patents, which was important. In the end, they couldn't have gone public if we had not filed the patents. Uh, that and I told them in a board meeting, I said, the most important thing that I probably will have ever done for the company is file these patents. But after a year, they changed chief executive officers, and again, I I didn't really click. What was the business of Infoblox? Uh, they, they were doing DNS routers, DNS servers. And it was really great. I mean, we had failover, fail, fail back. I mean, the biggest problem with DNS is when things get out of sync and we had things all syncing up and we could, we had farms of, of DNS servers where you can, you know, just constantly keep on pulling the power on, on them randomly and it still stayed up and, and served. Mm -hmm. and. That's really what people want because you you have to be able to resolve names, right? So, and then beyond that, you went to what quantum? Uh, yeah, I went to quantum as a consultant, uh, and then they they tried to you know bring me in as a full time and uh, to to take care of the dedupe uh, group, and I did that for a while, uh, and then turned into their chief technology officer but they too were going through some very difficult financial times. And so um, I ended up uh, leaving them and, um, uh, it, you know, uh, for, for a while joining uh, one of the Hadoop startups uh, and, uh, and then eventually started my own company with uh, um, Fred as, Carlson. As a hardware, uh, you know, did Quantum think of itself as a hardware company and software is a secondary thing, or is that? Well, is the you know, they they had this ongoing um, revenue stream from you know tape formats and and tape you know and stuff like that. Um, but I think they looked at the future. I mean, they also had a hierarchical file system. Um, the guys in Minnesota, these were old, you know, Cray guys. In fact, you know. Um, and uh, they were doing some interesting things. So a lot of their stuff was used like by Major League Baseball and other things because it enabled you to, and by large media companies, it enabled you to keep stuff out on tape but refer to it in the file system, be able to bring it back on the fly. Um, so uh, that's where I lived mostly inside of Quantum. Um, so that was a short stint, right? That was a short stint. Yeah. Yeah. And then. Uh, again, I went off and helped a Hadoop company for a little bit, um, but uh, that was, you know, not meant to be. And so I ended up, again, starting a, a company with Rick Carlson uh, called Graphite Systems, doing very, very um, parallelized access to Flash. So it was a big data machine, we had about 100 terabytes of Flash. And so we had about 6,000 devices. So think of NVMe on steroids. Um, so the OS actually controlled all 6,000 devices. And the concept was if you wrote in parallel, I'm sorry, if you wrote distributed, you could read in parallel. Uh, and so we did, you know, like queries for Twitter, where they had 200 machines doing a query that would normally take them about 30 minutes on 200 machines, and we could do it in eight minutes on one machine. So there must have been far more applications than Twitter. What, what was the? Well, it was all about you know databases. So things like Bongo and Couchbase, and you know it's all database. Oracle. We ran. Um, you know we we kind of redid um, 
a database from I redid a database from scratch uh, that did everything you know very much parallelized and we ran it on AWS and beat Oracle native uh, on TPC for example so it was a combination again a hardware solution with a software solution um, and you know the uh, I think the technology there was really good, but it also was at a time before har you know large capital intensive investments were being made by VCs. So it came to 2015, people consolidating portfolios, this is Sequoia, uh, and they said, you know, sell this thing because we can't. I told them I walked in the first day and said we need 50 million to do this, and they gave us 20. <laughs> <laughs> And so, uh, so they sold it off to DSSD, which you know was part of EMC at that point. Was DSSD? That was the object-oriented thing by um, the guy from Sun. Uh, I can't remember his yeah, name. Part of EMC. But, but it became part part of EMC, and they basically wanted my guys because we basically what we did was we knew how to uh, use Ethernet as the transport for these 6,000 devices. Mm -hmm. and, um, and our guys knew how to do this, both in the ASICs as, as well as in, in the software. And so they basically bought the staff and paid Sequoia back for their investment. Okay, so then EMC acquired Graphite? EMC acquired Graphite, and then Dell acquired EMC, and then Dell ended DSSD which therefore ended graphite. So did you stay through those acquisitions or part of nope. them or? Nope, 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 <laughs> <laughs> I moved on. From uh, the first one? <laughs> I, yeah. So the Heavenstone started at that time? Or? Again, okay. yes. Uh, it, it started in 2004 after Infobox, but continued um, through that time. But like, yeah, when I consulted for Quantum, I was using Heavenstone and so, so, so maybe we can transition to risk five then. Yeah. So I, you know, I, um, uh, you know, I finished with uh, with uh, EMC, and um, I was in a startup for a very short period of time, but my wife um, uh, was diagnosed with cancer, and and so she was, uh, you know, she was diagnosed in 2012. I sold the place to EMC in 2015, uh, but by December of 2015, uh, it was clear that she wasn't going to make it. So I took the year off and took care of her uh, till the end of 2016. Um, no, it, you know, we made the best of it we could. Uh, she was a psychotherapist. We processed a lot of the grief. We, you know, she had a short respite. I took her on a cruise around the British Isles and we saw Springsteen at Wembley, you know. You know, Vivaldi at St. Martin in the Fields. So, uh, so you know, we made the best of it we could. But um, luckily, uh, with the sale of of graphite, I was able to actually take that year off pretty easily and, and go do that. Um, and then uh, I ended up starting consulting for uh, again through Heavenstone for FICO and working on the stuff that I told you about before. So, I'm um, working at FICO there for about three years and I get a call from it's a long time for your uh <laughs> yeah it is I, I usually don't don't do that uh but in November of 2019 I got a call from the MIPS guys saying hey would you throw your hat in the ring for this and I said okay sure and that specifically was for the CTO job or for the for the CTO job at risk five and then COVID hit <laughs> so uh, every couple months, I get a call from them. Hey, would you talk to a couple more people? Sure. And yeah, at, le at least in my past, when I end up talking to 20 people, like something doesn't go right, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Something's things kept here. on going well. And they call me and say, oh, you know, because it started with 30 people um, applying. And, uh, and again, you know, it, w it wasn't something that I really cared one way or the other about. I didn't really know a whole lot about it. And they call and they say, well, we're down to 10. Will you talk to some more people? Sure. Hey, we're down to the final three. Will you talk to some more people? Sure. And then finally, like in May, uh, they called me and said, hey, we're making you an offer today. I go, what? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so they said, yeah. Um, 
So and people don't normally go out and search for CTOs. They're normally part of the founding group or you know, they come up inside or whatever. Tell me a little bit about the Risk Five organization. Don't sure. Tell me a lot about it. Just uh, so, and so how this evolved, and I, I know the early roots, uh, but uh, tell yeah, me so how that's uh, come about. Yeah. You know, so Risk Five started at Berkeley. Um, you know, they started doing a bunch of seminars on it, telling people about it. There grew interest. 2015, 2016, they started this foundation inside of Linux Foundation, um, and um, and. You know, they moved along without a CTO, and they had a president, and um, went on for a number of years, and they switched uh, presidents. And um, uh, the, you know, they got this president who is, I, I think, more on the marketing side, and uh, she wanted a partner on the technical side. Um, and um, who is this? This was Calista Redmond. Okay. Um, and she's an amazing boss. She's just done amazing things for Res Five, um, and. And, you know, most of the people who are like micro-architects or ISA architects or whatever, even compiler or operating system architects, they're working for startup companies putting out RISC-V product, right? And so I think it, you know, it, it was, you know, not something that was obvious to a lot of people. And then the second thing is we have 3,000, like, technical members uh, who, you know, some of them are corporate members and they may have a bunch of technical people. We probably have about five or 600 active technical members. And we have, you know, probably something on the order of 55 groups, half of them doing specs, half of them doing strategy, gap analysis and prioritization. When I started, there were 15 groups. So how many people within the RISC V Foundation, is this the appropriate term? To uh, RISC V International mm -hmm. is, okay. is the term now. They changed it, they moved to Switzerland because it was more acceptable to all parts of the world. So Switzerland has now become the Switzerland uh, for technology as well. Um, and, and so, I mean, right now we maybe have 12, 13 employees. Most of them are program managers. Uh, there's, right now there's two technical people. There's myself and I have somebody working on a technology called SAIL out of Cambridge, which is a formal modeling language for ISAs. So not RTL, you know, not Chisel. It's, it's really specifically for specifying ISAs. Um, but everybody else are really technical program managers or marketing program managers or marketing managers or marketing directors. Um, and so, you know, when they were looking for somebody, I think the things that resonated with them were what I did with Solaris because I had 2,500 people around Solaris, only 500 reported to me, and I had to make this thing work, mm -hmm. right? Um, and you know, I was an early employee of MIPS, and I really understood a bunch of pieces of the ISA. Um, they knew I was not a, a hardware guy, right? I was a software guy. They also knew that most of what they were doing was hardware, and most of what they needed to do was software. So when I started, you know, I would say, you know, out of the 15 groups, 14 of them were hardware and one was software. Um, now, two thirds of what we do really is around software. And the software could be on the software hardware boundary, things like IOMMUs, so how you do memory mapping for IO, or it could be on um, how you're going to deal with microarchitecture side channel attacks for, you know, you know uh, or control flow integrity or things like that. So uh, I did the same thing here that I did at, at, at Solaris. I created these organizations that were responsible for major areas. So there's one that's responsible for SOC, so that's the hardware software boundary, quality of service, RAS, IOMMU, debug, trace, all that kind of stuff. Um, one's on security and, you know, it's doing memory isolation, uh, microarchitecture side channel, you know, uh, crypt cryptography, uh, acceleration, uh, et cetera. Um, applications and tools, so runtime libraries, tool chains, uh, and then privileged software, so operating systems, and um, y you know, there's things like SBIs and UEFI and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then, then there's two ISA committees, one for unpriv and one for priv, and those are the, the, the six major committees and each one of them under them have a bunch of task groups and a bunch of special interest groups. That so how does this stuff. all work? Uh, what, I mean, who decides 
what the next group is, who decides how it functions, who decides That's what the right. membership is, who decides the, the final so thing, what's the... So yeah, and can I add to the question? Uh, does it, is, is like competitive to ARM? I mean, does the ARM have a similar kind of uh, operation? Uh, so, so no, both ARM and x86 are proprietary commercial architectures. So if you want to modify x86, you can't, right? If you want to modify ARM, you can, but you've got to pay them a lot of money to do so, right? And, you know, they're, they've changed their licensing over time, but they're, um, they've also got, you know, they've been around since the 90s, and they have a lot of uh, legacy things and baggage. We stand on the shoulders of giants. We, we benefit both from, you know, x86, ARM, Power, HPPA, Spark, you know, et cetera. We, we benefit from seeing all that they've done. And we also benefit from Linux and watching this community grow up. Unlike Linux, so Linux is open source. We're an open standard. You got to think of us more like Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. However, we're more pervasive. You know, Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, you, you work on your protocol and you make sure the apps that use those protocols work and you're done. With us, it's general purpose computing. It's everything, right? It's basically a, you know, the equivalent of a Turing machine. <laughs> it's like, this is it, right? And so, um, so we aren't like them. Um, and so we, we do have very, so when I came in also, because I had done governance before with Solaris, I, I came in and my first question was, okay, how do you guys know you're done with spec? And they go, uh, I don't know. I go, all right, you're gonna have a way to do that. I'm not telling you what it is, but I'm telling you, you have to have one. And so now we have governance, we have a life cycle and we have major milestones. We also have a process around group creation. And so the board of directors, you, you get to be a member of RISC V by membership dues, because that's what pays my salary and does our conferences and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the board of directors delegates all technical things to the technical steering committee. Um, so there's, you know, if you have a board seat, you also get a technical steering committee seat. The other people who have technical steering committee seats, there is a, a fee you can pay to be on a technical steering committee. But also, if you're a committee chair, so if you're running security, you get a seat and a vote on, the, on that uh, group as well. One vote, one company. So it's very egalitarian. So if there's duplicate representation, only one gets a vote. If you want to create a new spec, let's say, for example, you want to do matrix ops. You put a proposal together. It has to be sponsored by a committee. So it'd be sponsored, in that case, by the M-Privileged Instruction Committee. And they would come to the Technical Steering Committee and say, we want to start this. And they have to have it be pretty small because in the past, we did things that took forever. So vector took us six years. Bit manipulation shouldn't have. It took us four years. And we don't let that happen anymore. It's divide and conquer, smaller things, get them out. There are different types of matrices. You can do something that's tacked onto vector. You can do something that's a whole different instruction set and blah, blah, blah. So you'd go into the technical steering committee and say, we want to create this. And uh, at that point, there would be a preliminary charter and there would be, uh, we had already done a call for candidates and we will have picked a couple of candidates for chair and vice chair. And then the TSC would vote. Um, they get to interview, they get to do whatever they want, um, and then they go ahead and s start the group. And then the group has to go through the life cycle. There's a plan milestone where you say what your proof of concept's going to be, you say what your timeline's going to be, you say what your strategy's going to be, uh, et cetera. Um, and it goes on from there. It's just it's sort of normal stuff, except the end product isn't an implementation. We don't do any implementations. It's only a specification. That's why we're a standard, open standard, as opposed to open source. We have some sister organizations, Chips Alliance, uh, uh, Open Hardware, Low Risk, they're all doing implementations that are open source that people can use. They have RTL, DV, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. Um, so, uh, so that's sort of the basics of how it works. And, you know, we run it with a set of meetings. Um, and, you know, I kind of go to more meetings than anybody else, um, and I, part of my job is to make sure the left hand knows what the right hand is doing, because we don't want duplication in various uh, areas. Um, 
We also want to make sure that we foster the software ecosystem, so we have great relationships with open source projects like GCC, LLVM, Linux, um, et cetera, because that's the only way this works, right? If you have a ISA without software, <laughs> it's pretty useless. So, uh, so there's been just a great amount of work in that arena. I just went to Linux Plumbers and GCC Cauldron last past fall, and you know, we, we did get a bit of an earful. You know, we're we're in this the supply chain issue, so there's a dearth of, of of development boards out there. But hopefully, that will be freeing up and fixing uh, this year. Uh, but we have those open lines of communications, uh, and y you know, th the greatest thing is I tell everybody we're a continuous improvement organization. If you don't like what you see, your members help us make it better. Oh, you're doing too much. Well, what don't you want to do? <laughs> it's up to them. You want to do something? Well, are you willing to lead? Are you willing to be a chair or a vice chair? Are you willing to be an author of a spec? Those things are really important. If you aren't willing to do those, and you just say you want it and it's a gap, that's not going to happen, right? So it's, it's a very you know, large community. We've also um, created a thing called Development Partners, which is unique because we didn't have enough software developers within the community. Most of them were ISA developers and VLSI developers and you know, stuff like that. And so we got folks like IIT Madras and China Academy of Sciences to take on whole pieces. There's a lab called Rios Lab, which is a joint thing between Berkeley and, and Tsinghua University. And, They've taken on all the formal model work and all the architecture tests for Vector. Um, and so we've done some innovative things in order to get this thing going. But uh, the thing that's amazing is that we started with 15 groups, you know, two and, two and three quarter years ago. And we're sitting at, you know, probably again, 50 active groups at this point. And, you know, they're working in every corner that you could think about. Yeah, so looking at the size of this organization, I mean size of the community, uh, how do you uh, keep the conflicts from rising where they? Well, I, I mean, so first of all, we don't allow encumbered information in any RISC-V venue. That's important. You know, it, we don't want to contaminate members. If somebody has something, they got to work with their council. Um, you know, if they want to have a side conversation with other members, they do that. So. So that's the first thing. We don't, just don't allow that. We don't, you know, there are other architectures where they've actually given open source to Linux, and, but the, um, the document explaining it is proprietary. We don't allow those things in. The other thing is we don't allow implementations in. So if you take a look at, you know, you know something like bit manipulation, there's a standard way to go ahead and do s some stuff, and it's encumbered. Well, we don't care about that. That's really up to the implementers to deal with. That's not up to us to, de to, to deal with. Um, we work with OIN, the Open Invention Network, and, and Unified Patents, uh, and you know, they're, they work to try to keep, you know, um, uh, you know, keep trolls at bay and other things and, and stuff like that. So, so number one is around IP. We're, we're really careful. Um, then the second thing is is that you know, we have a hierarchy, and I try to build an organization that would scale. And I push power down, but stuff has to roll up. It's, it's trust and verify, right? So people have to tell us what they're doing, and, and, you know, there are some checks and balances in place. Every committee that exists has to sign off on every milestone for every spec. So. You know, if you're putting in vector and you don't talk to security and like you're going to have a hole, it's going to be shut down, you know, at some point during the process. Um, we also have a public review cycle, so 45 day or 30 to 45 day public review. Um, so the world gets to comment at a certain point and then we have to, you know, sort of resolve those comments. I mean, it could be like, hey, that doesn't make sense because of this and this, and they, they can say, oh, this needs a clarification in the spec, we'll do that, so on and so forth. So um, we manage the organization by distributed control and by as efficient communication as we possibly can have. But, you know, when you're dealing with 500 engineers, right, and 70 leaders, 
that sometimes is difficult. So I am, uh, my boss has called me the chief diplomatic officer, and I, I hope, I, I aspire to live up to that name. Yeah, that's mm. a uh, but I'm kind of the omnibusman yeah, at times. This is amazing. Yeah. So there are companies that y y you have the spec, others have to actually implement this. So yes. there are companies, one I'm familiar with, Andy's technology. Perfect example. So they take the spec and they say, we're going to implement this portion of it. They may not implement everything. Is that right? I mean, is there a minimum set? Is there? House? Yes. So it's a really good question. And, and it's a really good time to ask the question because just last Thursday, the board of directors ratified the first profiles. You think of profiles as a generation of instructions that work together, like RMB6, RMB7, or some Xeon family, or whatever. Um, so we have um, uh, major profile groups, which have a set of instructions with them. And those are the things that we ask the distros and the tool chains to target. So they're not distros targeting are our Linux distributions okay. um, and, and, the, um, and the tool chains so that they're not chasing everything. Mm -hmm. And so you can say, hey, so there's a, we have technical names for them. Marketing's working on marketing names. I just want to have that disclaimer. But so our, our first major release was RVA20, everything that was, was ratified in 2019 or earlier. And so the idea is that it's about portability. If you went ahead and compiled your application, you can run it on multiple implementations. That's what, what profiles are about. Um, so we do that, and we're working on platforms as well because we need the same thing for operating systems so that an operating system can have one set of bits and be able to run it on multiple implementations with just some configuration kind of stuff. So getting back to the question of Andes, for example, is there um, they have to implement a minimum set of things to be able if, to run. The if they want to brand as RVA twenty compatible, or you know, they have to do that. But Andy's not only does that. This is one of the unique things around RISC five. We allow custom instructions, so Andy's can have custom instructions that they know their customers need, mm -hmm. um, and we're okay with it. Mm -hmm. Right? It's like just fine, because right. we think that things like that breed innovation. And a lot of things that may be custom today may be sedimented in the future. And they may come to us and say, look, we really want this to be standard in the future. Uh, but Andy's, you know, they provide IP. Um, their supply chain is quite long. So ASUS just announced a board based on Renesis. Renesis is based on Andy's. And it's a board that's used for automotive. So somebody at some point is going to have some automobile company using that technology in order to go ahead and do their next generation of uh, whatever, you know. And a lot of times we see people because, so look, the, the ramp for different products is different amounts of time. So IoT, embedded, all that kind of stuff, it's shorter. We have a nearby manufacturer in China called Blue Trump. They have, you know, since 2021, at, at least 600 million um, risk five cores per year uh, for profit. That they, they develop themselves? That they develop themselves. Mm -hmm. They don't care about us because they're embedded, they're running a captive application, it's not general purpose computing, it's not multi-user, it, it, it's fine for them, they're happy, right? And then you, and, and so for them, it's a short period of time to go ahead and develop. But then you go up the chain and it takes longer. Disk drives are a year and a half. Automobiles are probably three years. Uh, servers are probably five years, you know. So it takes a different amount of time. So a lot of the stuff that you're seeing that has come out in RISC-V has really been in the I embedded, uh, embedded in IoT space. Uh, at our summit in December, Qualcomm announced quietly that they had <laughs> they had already shipped 650 million RISC-5 cores on their Snapdragons and that they were going to add more cores. Because what happens over time is you have it do security or some I.O. piece and then you start expanding, you know, what you can do with it. Um, and so you throw down more cores. EDA's experienced a renaissance in the last 15, 20 years. The modularity, things like chiplets, you know, make it just easier to plunk something like that down and go, go do something with it. So can somebody take I mean, taking one of your examples, like this earbud manufacturer, they could take any portion of yours and implement it. 
they don't have to be compatible with anybody, right? And they right. don't have they to don't claim care. that it's RISC V or They don't whatever. care. They don't brand for themselves, let alone for RISC V. <laughs> so they can take whatever piece works for them. Yeah. And as you know, they have to implement a certain amount of and stuff. So no the other architecture ecosystem works, and no other architecture will let you do that for you know for free, right? right. <coughs> so do you care, as an entity, uh, how many cores are developed versus say ARM cores? Uh, look, we, we we care because we get asked by places p places like Semico, right? Like, and we we right. can't, but we don't require people do that. Right, um, I think what we care about more than anything is that um, we remain a community. And the reason we're a community at all is because people get to share the effort. They get to share the effort to define the ISA, and they get to share the effort, more importantly, in developing the ecosystem for, for the ISA. Even large companies, the Googles and Intels of the world, would not want to spend the money on implementing everything in the ecosystem needed for a new ISA. We share that burden, and that's actually, that's the gravity, that's the thing that keeps us together as a community, because, you know, we, we share the work in GCC or LLVM or, you know, uh, Kronos libraries, you know, the graphics libraries or whatever it is. We share that effort as a community. That's why profiles work. People want one target because they don't want things to be divergent to the point where it's, you know, they have to maintain things themselves. If somebody does something custom, that's really good, but they've got to go ahead and maintain the tools themselves. We don't, you know, tell the, the tool chain or distros to go ahead and support those things. But sometimes things like time to market or differentiation are so important that people go ahead and do that, and we allow them to. We encourage them to. We think it's great. Um, so um, it's, it's just an amazing uh, uh, ability. And I think it gives people comfort. I mean, this again goes back to it's their house. They want to put some fancy stained glass window in the front, you know, we're good with it. So people can do anything they want with it. If they want to, if they want to label it as risk five whatever, they have to re meet some benchmark standards, run certain tests or whatever. Correct. Uh, but if they don't care about branding, branding, they can do it or they damn well please. Right. And even if they do care about branding, we do have sort of a grandfather brand, um, which has the basic instructions and you can they can brand under that. But they'll say, you know, RISC-V compatible for RVI-20. And th th again, that's a very nerdy name. Right. So. And are you constantly? Are, are, what's the pressing need at this point? Why? What's the area that is not being served, or that there's most demand for? Or now you have fifty groups working. It's like <laughs> we've got it covered. Well, or what's the? No, there's. I mean, look, we, you know, for better or for worse. I mean, we started from ground zero, right, in twenty. 15-ish, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, these other architectures have had 30, 50 years, you know, behind them. Yep. And so, um, so, you know, there are things that people have become accustomed to on other architectures that, you know, they want to see something similar or, or better uh, in RISC V. And we're all member driven. Again, if a member doesn't want to lead it, it doesn't happen. So members come to us and say, hey, you know, I'm doing this debugging thing and I really could have, uh, use a buffer that has the control transfer history of, you know, for, you know, some amount of entries of all the branches and jumps that have been taken. And, you know, then, then you start having the discussions and you need it for, you know, different layers of protection because you might have different domains, you might, you know, whatever. Those are the discussions that happen in, 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 in a group. Mm -hmm. um, but it's driven by need. It's not, it's not like we arbitrarily come in and say, we have to have this. Like, it's not Krista, who's, who's the godfather of, of RISC V. It's not him coming in and saying, no, we have to have this. It's members coming in and saying, we have to have this. Um, you and know, then they've got to step up to do it. They do. And, and look, it's hard because a lot of the folks who are come from the microarchitecture or VLSI piece of the world, 
aren't the folks who grew up with Linux, mm -hmm. right? By 2014, supposedly something like 80% of the Linux developers were paid by their companies to work full-time on Linux. We don't have that situation. I mean, our contributor culture is still evolving. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, the companies have to say, yes, this is important enough for me to do to spend time, you know, have you spend time, you know, doing that because I'm paying your salary, mm -hmm. right? But I think everybody who's like, you know, part of the risk five economy is learning there's, you know, great opportunities for them to, to sell product and make their customers happy. Are folks from Berkeley involved, Dave Patterson involved? Oh yeah, Dave's uh, the vice chair, Krista's the chair. Um, y you know, there's uh, uh, some cadre of those folks who went to Sci-5, and Sci-5 is a very big contributor to Risk V. Um, and, and it's, yeah, uh, y you know, a lot of universities are involved um, all around the world. It's every continent you can think of except for maybe Antarctica. Uh, we, we've got people involved, and it's, it's really exciting. Um, we also have a lot of work in trying to train the next generation of engineers. So we give out um, uh, single board computers, we have a bunch of classes, we have mentorships, because we know it's not just what you do today, but it's, it's when somebody goes to work and somebody's asked, hey, what, how, how, what should we do? If they have experience with RISC-V, they'll go, hey, you should consider RISC-V, right? And we know that that's a, an important piece of the, of the pie. So it must be very satisfying for you? As a it's great. You know, I, I, in some ways, um, it's one of the most challenging jobs I've had, and one of the, in some ways, it's the easiest job I've had. I don't hold secrets. I work for a nonprofit. I can't sign an NDA, right? This is really cool. I mean, you don't realize how cool that is until you're living it. Um, I, I don't have to tell somebody some story about when I'm gonna get product out, because my product is specs. And you know, when you're in community, somebody goes on vacation, what are you gonna do? I mean, they don't work for me. It's not like I'm gonna say, hey, you need to work over the holidays or something, right? So, you know, I, I always felt like, Every time I thought I knew patients, the universe taught me how much I didn't, right? Uh, and, and this is one of those cases where you go, okay, you just have to be patient. It's gonna, if it doesn't happen today, it's gonna happen tomorrow. Those are my boss's words. And, and, you know, doing that, but being encouraging and still trying to get people to sign up for things, uh, that's an interesting challenge. Um, you, you know, making sure that, that, again, the left hand knows what the right hand's doing. When you got 50 groups going with people from different companies and different agendas, well, that's a challenge. Did you model this after anything? Is you have to create this from whole cloth? Or? Well, I, I, you know, the, the basic pieces of pushing power down, finding good leaders to lead the, the committees, because everything lives under the committees, that that's from Sun. That's that's what I developed at Sun, uh, you know, and did for Solaris, um, and and successfully. And so, um, so I knew I wanted to head in that direction. But but again, we're in a community. It's not like I can dictate that that's what's going to happen. You know, I spent many many hours with you know different senior architects explaining what I was trying to accomplish, and finally, you know, got. I mean, I wanted it to be regular. I mean. Guys who are engineers don't think about regularity in organizations. They just don't, right? And so I wanted it to be regular. I, again, I wanted to push power down. I, I tried to not have everything bottlenecked by some committee. Um, but I also tried to make sure that there was some process in place, right? Um, and, and that's, again, that's the synthesis where I go, okay, I understand what they're trying to do techni technically. Now let's figure out how to make them successful. Let's make sure we do things that, you know, pass, you know, sort of the, the basic test of reasonableness. And, and so, yeah, uh, I, and I wrote a book on uh, 100 questions to ask your software organization. Some of that stuff's in here. Uh, uh, you know, I wrote it years and years ago and mostly informed by, by the experience at, at Sun. But, you know, we're also, I mean, just things like getting meeting times 
when you got folks in India and Europe and LA and Boston and oh my God, right? 7 a.m. Is, is the most you know, amazing time. That's when everybody wants. We tried to make things more friendly for China and they said, stop doing that. We work our day jobs during the day. We want to you know, do our meetings at night for you guys. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. So you learn things like that. And again, we're continuous improvement. So you know, we take um, input from everybody and try to incorporate it so that we're doing a better job. Um, I don't think there is a project that's this big that grew this quickly ever in the history of open standards. I, I don't th think there is one that exists. Now there are some that are this big, but th they grew over time. Uh, and this is just um, a stunning piece of work by the teams. They is just, there any similarity between your organization or how things get done in Wikipedia? Uh, I don't think so. I, you know, I think Wikipedia is uh, way different. I, I knew one of the principals over there, and what they described to me isn't what we do. I mean, you know, w we're doing technical work, right, defining these things, and th that's really not what they're doing. Uh, you said uh, in India it's IIT Madras? That? Uh, that's one of the, the groups. They also have the Shakti Project, which is um, a government-related, but the government of India is actually on our board. They're a board member. Um, y you know, we have just great participants from India. I mean, energetic, knowledgeable. Uh, they're part of the other groups are part of development partners, but they also are just doing an incredible amount of work, and we're very grateful. I also heard that the two things I heard was uh, somebody's working on a, in India. They're working on a uh, hearing aid with RISC-5 in it, and somebody's working on a cane with RISC-5 in it. It's like, okay, why do you want a cane? So I guess you count the steps or something. I don't know what it is. Um, but um, so a lot of innovation. And that's one of the things that RISC-5 does. It gives you the ability to do interesting new things. I heard that there was a 12-year-old or 13-year-old in India who actually created a, uh, a RISC-5 chip on his own. And that's the other thing. We have so much stuff that's out there. I mean, look, there are proprietary implementations, commercial implementations like Andes and blah, blah, blah. But there's also, you know, so many designs out there for RISC V that anybody can pick up and just go do, and then you can throw it onto an FPGA and do something, right? You know, it's pretty exciting. Thank you. Anything else? No, that. Uh uh, I think covers it. Anything we've missed that you yeah. would like to uh, <laughs> say about uh, your career or uh, your observations of things going on these days? Or well, I, I mean, I think the biggest thing is, you know, is gratitude. I, I am just so grateful. You know, I I often didn't chase the money jobs. I chased the jobs that I thought would make me happy, and um, and this job makes me happy, and. Uh, I don't know if it always will, but I'm very grateful for every day I wake up and have a chance to do this because this is changing the world. Mm -hmm. This is not, you know, uh, some small thing. I mean, you know, probably, it, you know, in twenty twenty one, over ten billion risk five cores were sold for profit. I was going to ask you, do you have what's your Marketing number, whatever. Of, well, uh, sort of I mean, it's anecdotal because we only, right. when people tell us, you know, and the, all of a sudden you hear from the right. Qualcomm's, the NVIDIA's, the Blue Trums, you know, et cetera, uh, Alibaba. I mean, you just hear how much is being shipped, and all you can do is kind of add it together and go from there. I, I you know, sometimes I, I wish we, we did require people report how many cores so we, we knew, but pardon me, I guarantee you that, that it's it's like all over and it's you billions know, yeah it's billions i mean it's you know if it was 20 in 2021 if it was 10 billion you can imagine what it is now right. i i think you know the other thing is our our buzzword our key th there's there's two of them one is risk five everywhere mm -hmm. and the other is risk five is inevitable mm -hmm. and and so um you know we we get shocked every day when i see some new product come out it's exciting and I'm grateful to be part of it. I'm grateful that I'm working with such brilliant people and I get a chance to help make them successful. Um, I mean, how many times in your life do you get a job like this? 
not many. That's right. Yeah, I think it shows. <laughs> the joy shows in there. Yeah, I definitely have joy. There is no question about it. And I'm grateful for you uh, both asking me to talk. So. All right. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mark. Thank you. Thank you.